states had designs on Canada, and they weren't necessarily good. Uh, remember, after the Civil War, the Fenians were invading Canada from time to time, about five or six times. The U.S. cavalry was running along the Canadian, well, it wasn't really a border then, chasing the Sioux, and in some cases were they out to extirpate the Indian people. American uh, whiskey runners were up into Alberta in the 1870s, 1880s. There's Fort Wupa around Fort McLeod. So, in fact, during the Riel Rebellion, there was an agent of the U.S. government sent to Manitoba, not Manitoba then, but the Red River Colony to find out what was going on. They were checking things out. They'd like to move that border up. So, Louis Riel's Declaration of Independence, the Métis knew what was going on when the surveyors came out. They knew that the Crown, Canada, had it in mind there was going to be some settlement. They didn't want that. So there was the rebellion with the, what was it, I'll talk about that in a moment, three months to get the, uh, the soldiers out to deal with that. The other point is very quickly, Sir John A. Macdonald had something called the national policy, and that was with respect to Canada's development. And uh, at that time, there was no income tax. This is an important part of this. That happened after World War I. So there's some important things there. And to Rat Portage was this tiny little hamlet that I'm going to talk about. What you'll see here are some photographs we agreed would, uh, would help focus in your mind. This is a tunnel, uh, tunnel island. Uh, the first photograph, incidentally, is of a trestle bridge. Uh, keep that in mind because uh, that was very much a part of the construction, cheaper than filling in the land. So who would build the railroad? Uh, key, it was a key part of the conservative strategy going into the 1872 election. Sir Hugh Allen, a kingpin of shipping, I'm talking about steam shipping out in Montreal, wanted to build a railroad, and guess who was his primary backers? The Americans. Their plan was to build part of the railroad through the United States to avoid all of this land here in northwestern Ontario. Too difficult to build here. But they made a slight mistake. They gave Sir John A. $350,000 for his election campaign. That makes Carl Hein, Schreiber, and Brian Mulroney look like cheapskates. Because <laughs> this was worth millions. But a member of Parliament found out about it, asked a question in the House, and in 1873, Sir John A. had to step away. He had to step down, and the Liberals came to power. Now, thinking of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the Liberals then fuddled out for about five years trying to build the railroad without a lot of success. Never let the government run a project. You know that with Ontario Hydro. <laughs> so, and that was my business for 28 years. Not a lot happened. Some railroad building in Winnipeg, not, I said Red River Colony, down to Emerson. Railroad up to Selkirk, then a railroad towards Rat Portage as well. But not a lot of success. John A. came back in 1878. There was a bit of a depression at that time, and he said, damn, we're going to build this railroad and get it going. <clears throat> a consortium was put together. And interestingly, when the CPR was incorporated in 1881, it was Canadian participants, British participants, Americans, and the French. So, the key manager here in all of this is, was William Van Horn, but I liked his other name, Cornelius. He was brilliant, but remember, he worked on railroads during the U.S. Civil War. So you think about when the soldiers came out here to put down the rebellion in Batoche. Talk about that very briefly, too. The railroad deal. The deal was, in order to get the railroad void, remember there was no income taxes, there's no way by which you could subsidize the railroad construction except by raising uh, 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 import tariffs and so forth. Federal government gave the railroad group $25 million in cash, additional funding through the protectionist tariffs, and remember those tariffs killed Atlantic Canada. That's why the economy in the Atlantic went to hell in a handbasket, was the national policy. So, uh, they would also give 700 miles of railroad already built to the CPR, no taxes on imported equipment, 
because the tariff would have put on major taxes to get their equipment in. No competing line for 25 years, in other words, no competition. 25 million acres of land, watch that one in a moment, so that they could sell that land internationally to bring in settlers to raise grain that would fill the boxcars for the railroad that was going to be built. And the railroad had to be built in 10 years. So we had to then, the Government of Canada and the railroad, prepare the ground. And I don't think all of us think about that as much as we should. Because here's where some of the sinister bits begin. In 1868, Rupert's Land, remember the Hudson's Bay Company ran all of Western Canada. They did not want settlers. They did not want development. They wanted the fur trade to stay intact. In fact, a priest who wanted to build a bridge in Edmonton was stopped. That priest is going to come up later in the story by the Hudson's Bay Company. Manitoba became a province in 1870, so that dealt a little bit with the Riel effect. But the other thing is the, the government and the railroad needed certainty over land. In other words, there'd be no problems there. <coughs> what happened? The numbered treaties with the First Nations of this country were negotiated, and uh, Indian reserves were established in Around 1876, that was the first Indian Act, none of it good. And Treaty 3, of course, runs from the Manitoba border to just about Thunder Bay. So, with the treaties in place, the uh, Manitoba created, Rupert's Land bought, there was then the ground laid to move ahead. So, we have our friend Sir John A. Let's talk a little bit about uh, rat portage at that time. While all this noise is taking place in Ottawa and other locations, in 1879, rat portage only had about 700 people. There was one Hudson's Bay fort, excuse me, in store downtown, fur, fish, and mining. Mining uh, Mines were discovered around 1850 and were basis of the economy, and transportation was by canoe or riverboat. The Dawson Trail was an option. Remember, it was built there in the 1870s early, but it took 12 days to get from Port Arthur to Manitoba, uh, with 70 offloads, portages of, of whatever you had with you. I think that's why it took so long to get the army out west during the Riel Rebellion. But rat portage was recognized as having huge rich, uh, riches, but no way to get them out. So the railroad was important. And one of the thoughts in building the railroad is that they figured, geez, it's so difficult to build here. Maybe we should put in some canals and river systems and combination of railroad and water movement. <clears throat> it wasn't on. So how did the railroad get built? Well, it began in Winnipeg in 1877, and then from Thunder Bay closer to 1881. The route agreed was, uh, and there's a lot of work done to find dry ground, more or less, uh, because it's a lot of rocks, trees, and water. Between Port Arthur and Rat Portage, it went through Eagle Lake, Dryden, Wraith, Ignace, and so forth to Port Arthur. Eight work camps were formed up by the CPR group. And the CPR didn't actually do the work. They contracted it out. So these were independent contractors who put the uh, rail in place. One half mile of track was laid a day during construction. On the prairies, they did three and a half miles a day. So you get a sense of how difficult it was to build here. And that's Mr. Van Horn. And I may be off the sequence of my slides, but uh, that's okay. You duck under. Uh, so Van Horn is very much, he was brilliant driving this whole process, making sure that it stayed on time. So the method, how did they build the railroad? In northwestern Ontario, two construction uh, trains would go out each day in each direction. On the, each train, there would be sufficient, and then remember there were also camps in the forest there too, but the trains went out with sufficient men, horses, rails, spikes, and dynamite 
sufficient for a half mile of track. <clears throat> the first train would have 300 men and 70 horses on it. Wagons went out from the work train when they got to their work site with 300 ties, spikes, rails, and so forth. Ties were laid uh, uh, and spaced two feet apart. Six men on each side of the track put the, uh, the ties down and then carried the rails out. Someone then would make sure the gauge was right, the width was right, that they were lined up properly and they'd drive a spike at either end. When that was done, then they'd bring out the fish plates, those metal, square metal devices, put them under the rails, spike in the rails, and they'd move forward from there. It cost $1,200, 12 million to build 200 miles of track in northwestern Ontario. So if you do the numbers, that's probably a couple hundred million dollars maybe now. Enormous expenditures. <coughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, <coughs> swamps, lakes, rivers, and rock. Trestles, also known as bridges, but I call them trestles were used extensively because they cost one-tenth of what it would cost to put in fill. More than one company went bankrupt breaking up rock and putting it into the swamps that we enjoy because it just disappeared. In one area, seven layers of tracks subsided and several trains disappeared <laughs> as they tried to build that railroad. Bridge crews went out in advance to build these trestles so that when the rails arrived, there would in fact be uh, a trestle there to meet them. There were three dynamite plants to make up dynamite from nitroglycerin to, uh, to uh, blast out the rock. Now, when I start talking to you about the liquor, imagine liquor and dynamite. Doesn't work, does it? That's a problem. There was a trestle bridge, some of you might know, on the back end of Cameron Bay and Norma, just by the Dairy Queen, up until after World War I. And then it was filled in, and that's what you see there now. Well, that used to be Wajuskanigam. That was Rap Portage. And in a way, how tragic it is, because that's where our First Nations partners did their traveling. And symbolically, we killed that with the closure of that creek that went from Lake of the Woods into the Winnipeg River. So other trestles were built too, and then they were replaced with rail beds uh, when this double tracking occurred. CPR had the National Railroad done in four years. In 1885, six years ahead of schedule. I've got to pick up the pace here. So what were the economic effects of the CPR and rock portage? A 64 mile, square mile timber limit, 1873, was licensed on the lake. Now that the Indian title is extinguished, there are my quotation marks, horse feathers. We cut a treaty, but that didn't mean we owned all the land or had exclusive use of it. That seed release and surrender was a nasty choice of words that until the last 30 years when the Supreme Court got involved uh, were continually used. It was not a good deal for First Nations. But John Mather's company was formed in 1879 with one senator, a lot of politics there, as a shareholder. He had 500 employees. Remember, the population was 700 in 1879. 500 employees involved in the mill seasonally, then in the bush in the wintertime. Rat Portage Nut Lumber provided 3 million ties to the railroad. Lumber was shipped out west for the settlers. Imagine, because those settlers, 25 million acres, were starting to move west. There were seven sawmills by 1890, two of them water-powered, economic advantage because of the river, uh, and five by steam. Kuwait and Lumber and Milling Company moved a whole sawmill from Minneapolis by railroad to uh, the bottom end of the Red River, came up in a riverboat, and down the Dawson Trail, the Corduroy Road, to Lake of the Woods, on a barge, and up to Kenora. That's how economically sound this area was. In 1895, the CPR shipped one million board feet of lumber a week. You wonder where all the white pines went. <laughs> Flour mills were open because, guess who? Cornelius Van Horn discovered that the hydraulic power here, the water power, was incredibly important. 
So, uh, 2,500 barrels a day was going out of Kenora. There was a barrel stave company in Kuwait, and at one point, rack porridge was the largest uh, manufacturer or, or miller of flour in Canada. Five million pounds of fish and caviar were shipped out special trains. 900 tons of sturgeon and caviar came out of the big traverse in 1895. You wonder where all the fish went. They disappeared for a time. Who brought them back? Rainy River Band just in the last number of years, sturgeon. So, in 1892, there were 22 river boats running out of Kenora, and they left in the afternoon and ran overnight, and there were no buoys. How'd they do that? <laughs> they were bringing mail, people, freight, and other goods. Population of Kenora was 3,000 by 1900. For a time, the CPR was the main employer, in, uh, we're looking there at the fish, uh, those are sturgeon, uh, at, uh, for a time, the CPR was the main employer in Kenora with roundhouses, shops, train movements, trap gangs, that's natural. First and biggest gold rush was 1885 to 1899. Gold mines were of such quality that the gold was found at $15 a ton, cost them $4 to get it out, 11 bucks par margin. We were the biggest in the 1890s producer of gold in Ontario. We were thought to be the most promising gold region in America. A hammer mill was built in Kuwait to process the ore, but it died out for three reasons. Small scale, poor management, and disputed title. I'm gonna to get to that quickly, I've gotta move on. Three large hotels were constructed, there's the sawmilling. Three large hotels were constructed by 1885. Six were in place by the 1890s, one claimed it could host 400 people. What do we do now? Not the same. Tourist and cottager trains began to appear from Winnipeg. Double tracking began at the turn of the century. We had 3,000 people here by 1900. But there was a boom-bust economy, and we slid down after that. So let's talk about the social effects, and this is the best part in some respects. Thousands of railroad workers, 3,000 in fact, we're living in this area temporarily. The CPR had put in federal law, caused federal law to be created that banned drinking 10 miles on either side of the railroad tracks. At the beginning of construction, booze, bordellos, and alcohol gambling followed the railroad construction. It was estimated there was one illegal booze supplier for every 30 citizens in this town. Can you imagine? In one month, 800 gallons of legal alcohol was brought into Kenora. So if there were 700 people, husband, wife, a couple of kids, 150 men, women couldn't drink, that's a lot of liquor for that many people. More was smuggled, a lot more was smuggled, up the lake, on the trains, on in canoes, matters of that sort. Captain Kendall brought the boys, this is uh, to uh, Whiskey Island, and uh, 10 miles south on the lake, and the Clipper was the fastest boat there, and he also had a bordello on that island. Another point uh, was that, uh, you'll like this one, now the railroad called in, they had their own police force, they called in uh, the police because a fellow named Harrington had 50 gallons of alcohol at the edge of one of the work camps, in front of a body tent, no less. Railroad contractor found out, brought in the CPR constable, who arrested Harrington. Harrington said, I'd like to clean up before I go. He went into the body tent. His partner was in bed with the prostitute. He had two seven-shot revolvers, gave them to Harrington, who went out with them. CPR constable, quick draw, shot him before he could get it. And Harrington said before he died, I'd rather die than pay a fine. So <laughs> we had some interesting people here. So we had... Rap Forge was overrun with uh, navvies with money. 30% of the navvies were French Canadian. Archbishop of St. Boniface had a priest come to Kenora named Albert Lacombe, a missionary priest, to help out because it was so bad. George McPherson, uh, an Indian agent, said that while Indians were working on the CBR, he was very worried about their morals and ability to cope. Father, Lo I won't go into the detail here. I'm going to skip because I'm running out of time. But then, Rat Portage, who's the boss? Manitoba extended ownership, you, everyone might know this, of this area, the district of Kiwaito, that would be from Manitoba border to Wraith. 
just near Thunder Bay. They did it with John A. Macdonald's support. Ontario said, hey, what am I, chopped liver? But the federal government put in, with a railroad contractor paying the bill, a prison, a police force, and a judiciary. They brought in $6,000 in three months in fines. Manitoba, <coughs> we mentioned, Ontario passed or attempted to enforce its own law. So we had federal jails, we had Ontario jails, we had Manitoba jails, each arresting each other. <laughs> Manitoba Premier Big John Norquay showed up with 60 police and militia at one time to try and create an order. In 1883, Manitoba held an election where more people voted than were on the electors list. <laughs> The dispute went on and on, but eventually uh, it, uh, in fact, was resolved by Privy Council in favor of Ontario. But uh, I'm getting towards the, I'm going to skip the, the best bets too. A f company constable, I'll share this, seized four barrels of liquor and then shared it with his friends. He was called before a magistrate and fined for alcohol possession. This chap named O'Keefe paid the fine, waited till the judge went out, arrested him, put him in jail, they appointed a new magistrate, who in turn fined that magistrate, and on they went. One of the judges became a bootlegger. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I come towards the end then, what about the circumstances for First Nations? First Nations people have been here for 9,000 years. First Nations people had jurisdiction during the fur trade. They could tell who could come through here and who couldn't. The Indian agent, effectively in 1876, took all of that away from them. And at one time, 160 tons of blueberries went out of this area. Who picked them? The Duggins, incidentally, think of Kenora, were the ones who were buying blueberries, amongst others. So it was a sad time for First Nations people. So to get to the conclusion then of construction, uh, what an impact it had for Kenora. We thrived and survived this area through all kinds of booms, but that was the best one of all. That was the apex of our diversity. For First Nations peoples, it was a dark time. It wasn't until recently that John Ralston Saul said that First Nations are making a comeback. This area is rich beyond imagination. I just didn't have enough time to touch on all of it for you. Thank you. Thank you.